gracious Heavenly Father, because you are so loving and so merciful, I just give you all the praise. Thank you for your allowing us to continue in the study of your word together. I ask that you would just filter out all that which is not true, but seal to our hearts that which is. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi again, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. And uh, we are studying together in the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And uh, we're about to look at some something I think is quite exciting. I think over 500 some odd videos and, and we finally made it to heaven. Well, at least in study. Before we go on, uh, I want to lay some groundwork. You know, now I'm, I may not do a good job of that, but I feel that it's necessary. Figures of speech have a literal meaning. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you six of my basic convictions. And I cannot change my convictions. Number one, I believe in the inerrant Word of God, that it was uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I've mentioned this many times that I'm not interested in what John's thoughts were or John's logic was. Um, he merely held the pen, and God is the author of this book. Number two, I believe in the literal interpretation of Scripture unless there's uh, something in the context that indicates otherwise. Number three, common sense must prevail in every verse that we interpret. Now, I'm having to wear glasses now because of uh, some uh, recent... Uh, uh, eyesight problems <clears throat> so uh, if I look a little goofy well sorry about that it does re re uh, knock down the uh, the headaches pain just a little bit um, number four the meaning of a given sentence or or the or the definition of any word must begin with the the most common meaning based on the immediate context. I've stressed context a number of times and how important that is. Many Christians just get lost in a wasteland because they don't take note of context. And and folks, that's not just true with Bible study, it's true in reading anything. You know, what we read before and after that verse that we're so highlighting. And number five, it has to be balanced with other passages of Scripture. There's what they call the analogy of Scripture. It has to harmonize with the whole. No, no verse will contradict any other verse. And number six, figures of speech have a literal meaning okay uh, and figurative is not allegory all right they're and, and they're a part of normal conversation they are not allegories allegories look back and prophecy looks forward now let, let's think for a moment about prophetic scripture Now, God, we know God said to Abraham, Thy seed will be afflicted 400 years in Egypt. And we know that four is the number of judgment. And 400 is four times 10 times 10. So God is clearly saying He is really, really going to judge the children of Israel in Egypt. 
But what was the truth of the passage? They were afflicted 400 years in Egypt. The same is true with uh, uh, forty years in the wilderness, or that Israel wandered forty years in the wilderness. Four is the number of judgment. Okay, times ten, but it turned out to be forty years. Seventy years captivity in Babylon. Seven is the number of perfection. We can and we can go on with that. But, you know, there are hundreds of passages of prophetic Scripture whose interpretation is literal. You know, you can, uh, and you can go to seminary and, and you'll probably come out thinking that you know all this stuff that other people don't know. But God knows how to put into language what He wants you to know. And I don't think that God hid all these, these little secrets in His Word that He wants us to know. Folks, do you honestly believe that God who loves you like no one else does, you know, reserved a, some special revelation for just a select few, or, they, or He reserved uh, the deeper things of God for only the so-called experts? On, you don't believe that, do you? Why can't we simply take God at his word take his word at face value you don't need to understand the history of isaiah's time all right watch some documentary channel on you know to, to understand what isaiah said behold the young virgin shall conceive and bear a son and isaiah he looks at at, at mrs isaiah and, she, and says well, what do you think he meant and she says well it can't be a virgin because virgins don't bear children you know and so you can come up with all kinds of of uh, super interpretations on what that that meant well the simple truth is it meant what it meant it the simple truth is that the virgin did conceive and bear a son what about adam and eve you talk about some symbolism. You know, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent and he shall bruise his heel. That's, that's a lot of symbolism. Now, what do we do with that? You know, are we to be concerned with what Adam and Eve thought that he said? You know, I, folks, I could care less what they thought. I don't care what Abraham thought when God said his children were going to be 400 years in Egypt or what the children of Israel thought when they were going to roam 40 years in the desert or what they thought when it, when he said that they were going to be 70 years in captivity in Babylon I don't know what they thought you know if there were thousands of them they probably had thousands of ideas on what he said in all my years of studying this book I have never ever concerned myself really worried about or spent time thinking about what those who were listening thought. You know, I, I think the apostles were, you know, basically for the most part, they were confused over what Jesus taught, many of the things that he said. So why should I be concerned about what they thought or what Nicodemus thought? I'm of the mind that any one of us can simply take what God said at face value. John really did have a vision. Okay? It is called a vision. All right? There's where we start. We begin on that basis. The text does not say, and please don't click off till you've heard me out here. The text does not say that John had a rapture. Okay? It says that John had a vision. Now, 
and I mean, Christians are quick to jump on this first verse in chapter 4 as, well, see, there, there's the rapture. John was raptured. I think there, it's half true, and I, 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 hate to, I hate to even use that term, half truth. Let me try to explain my position on this, and I, and I hope, I, I'm sure I'll do a sloppy job of it. Uh, there, there's probably hundreds, at least, of ideas as to what this verse means and what that vision was about. So I'm, I'm going to throw my opinion into the bunch, and I'm going to suggest that John had a vision. Okay, I, you know, call me stupid, you know, if you want, but I think that's that's where we have to begin. And what he saw. Oh man, we got to figure out all that, what well, all that means, and all that. What he saw, folks, is what he saw. And it, and if it had been me. And I came back, I probably wouldn't be able to describe it to you folks in any different terms than just what John saw, which was given him by Christ. You know, the former vision which John saw, you know, in the chapters that we looked at, represented the state of the church at the time when the vision was given, or the things that then were, the things that were that were that then were okay and and they gave instruction to the churches to their messengers to encourage them in the faith and in uh, patience and excite them to service to excite them to to uh, to perseverance the same as paul's letters to the churches did i pointed that out it, it, the instruction can't be any can't be in conflict with paul and now the apostle, he records a second vision in which the things were revealed to him that should be afterward to the end of time or the things which were to come to pass in, in successive order from the time of the vision till the mystery of God should be finished. Chapter 4 of this book represents a dramatic change. That's where we have come to the point, folks, in this study and in this book. We've come to a place where that we see a dramatic change. And that's an understatement. We move now to the third division of the book. Okay, it was in chapter 1, verse 19, that we learned the proper divisions of the book. There John heard the Lord say to him, Write therefore what you've seen, what is now, and what will what'll take place later, or after this. And so it's important. It's, it's critical, I believe, to observe these three divisions because they'll guide us through the rest of the book. First, he was told to write what you have seen. That covers the vision of chapter 1. What John uh, saw was the Lord himself walking in the midst of the churches. Then he was told to write what is now. And that would be chapters 2 and 3. The letters to the seven churches. Which is, uh, which is a prophecy of the present age of the church. Then he was told to write what will take place after this. Enter chapter 4. Here we are. We're here. Okay? That's, that's how I'm seeing it. Chapter 4, where we begin today. The beginning of what will take place after you and I have left this place. Which I hope is soon. And I'm sure many of you do too. After this, okay, it says the text, after this, better these things, I looked. After these things, I looked. And I saw, literally I saw, not I looked as though, as though uh, John uh, 
you know, turned his gaze toward it, all right? Uh, that's not the word for look. In the, in, I have to go through the original text, the translations. There's 500 English translations alone. I'm trying to, to give you the best interpretation based on the original manuscripts. And in, in this case, the Koine Greek, uh, behold, the door was opened. And it makes it sound like, well, John looked up and he saw there was a door and it was closed, but then he saw the door open and that is not what the text says. The door stood open is what the text says. It was set open in heaven. He didn't look and see a door opening. He saw and the door stood open. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, if you want to take some time and look at and go through Hebrews chapter 10 there, you'll find a few verses that talk about that the way into the presence of God lies open. Okay? Now, that, that could be figurative. It could re, re, be referring, and I think it is referring to us here now. We have bold access to God through the finished work of Christ. Okay? In fact, there's a lot of wonderful things that can be said about this. We're co we've been ra raised with Christ. We're co-seated in the heavenlies in Christ. Okay? So, but the scene here is changed. It's changed from earth to heaven. We've crossed the threshold here, folks. The scene has changed from earth to heaven. And twice in that verse, at the beginning and the end, we're told that John will now be shown what will take place after this. After this. Okay? Uh, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice, which I heard, was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you the things which must be hereafter. After the church is finished, God is through dealing with the church, His program for the church. Keep in mind, when the church age ends, God then again tur uh, turns His attention to Israel to complete the program that He designed or decreed for Israel. So, God's done with us here and uh, we'll be caught away with the Lord. But you don't see the rapture here. Okay? You don't see the rapture. You see a, a vision a vision of what took take of what was taking place after the rapture that's my point I, that's the distinction that I want you to make and, and say I don't want you I don't want anybody to go around saying uh, uh, Steve said that chapter 4 verse 1 was us being caught up it's not us being caught up it's John's vision do you understand what I'm saying and I believe that's an important distinction to make now, John is is fir first. He's allowed to see into heaven. Okay, all right. Uh, now, there's something interesting going on here with this. Uh, but then, it's not. It, and God, I hate these glasses. It's not. Uh, just that John looked into heaven, okay? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, my mind's getting on two, two tracks here. I'm thinking of Enoch being caught up and then the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, sort of a type of, or, you know, anotype of the church, uh, you know, uh, being raptured, and then there's the tribulation. Uh, 
I see the rapture has already taken place. It's not mentioned. And what he sees is a door opened, which enables him to look into heaven where the rapture's already taken place. But he will go through that door. He's not the first one in Scripture to see into heaven. Okay, uh, listen. Ezekiel, let's see, Isaiah, Daniel, maybe, maybe a few others, they were allowed to look into heaven, to stand on earth and to see into heaven and observe what was taking place there. But there's something different here about John's vision. Please don't miss this that's worthy of taking note of, not only does John see into heaven, he's actually different than the rest. He's actually summoned into heaven. Okay? No other prophet, at least that I can find, in all of Scripture is called into heaven except John the Apostle. I don't want you to miss that point. Okay? He heard a voice like a trumpet saying to him, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. That's the viewpoint of John throughout the rest of the book of, the Revelation, of, this, of Revelation. Okay, That's his viewpoint, is from heaven. And many, that's why many commentators feel that this is the place in Revelation where the rapture of the church takes place. Folks, it's already taken place. I suggest it's already taken place. So, that's that's interesting because, you know, we would have that in a parenthesis here where that it was, you know, it's not even mentioned. I find that oddly interesting. There's something very special about that harpazo. But we'll, we're going to go on here with this. So from here on, from this point where we've begun in our study in this video here today, from this, from, from here going on forward, the church, which has been the focus of the opening chapters, is never mentioned again until, I believe, the final chapter. I mean, there's saints referred to throughout the book, but the word church doesn't appear again until the bride of the Lamb is seen at the end. So I'm persuaded that what John sees in the book from here on is what the church will see. It is what you will see. It's what I will see after it is caught away to be with Christ. Okay? There, there's not... I want you to think for a moment. Okay? We can't have two separate scenes. We can't have two entirely different scenes. That wouldn't make any sense. If you really want to know what you're going to see after the rapture, look at chapter 4. may not be the, uh, you know, what you want to see. It may not be that big bass lake where, you, you know, you catch a, a large a, a prize fish, you know, every cast, or it may not be that... That, that golf course in the sky where you get a hole in one all the time, or in my case, it, you know, uh, that uh, I, I suppose that, that would be the, the uh, have something to do with, you know, like a, the big horse ranch in heaven or something. It's not going to be like that. At least, at least for the time being. Folks, there's, there's still work to be done. Just the fact that we rule and reign with Him means that I don't, I don't believe there's anything in the text that indicates that we will be doing anything other than what, we're, what we see ourselves doing here through this, throughout this period, the tribulation period. So, So as we continue on, we're, we're, we're no longer looking at things from the standpoint of time, but of eternity, which is what makes the book both fascinating and, and hard to, well, sometimes hard to interpret. Uh, I don't, 
look, we are, we live in this world of time. We're so used to it. We, you know, we know that uh, we live in a dimension, if you want to call it that, of a prescribed uh, events. There's a sequence of events, you know. I'm going to do this today, do this tomorrow, do this, you know, or five minutes from now, and then an hour from now I'll be doing, you know. There's a sequence of events. And we know we can't go backwards in time, you know, we can't go forward. We can only live in the present. But uh, in eternity, that frame of thought doesn't have any reference at all. You know, when we think of heaven, we, we tend to think of that place as an extension of time. Okay, when in fact, time doesn't exist. Well, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shine, shut up, okay? There's no time. Now, I'm, I hope I didn't offend anybody there. I love that song. I don't, I don't know of any Christian who doesn't. It's just, I'm trying to make a point here, all right? You know, when we talk about it, people find it hard to describe forever. Uh, to me, I, it, it's quite simply the forever now. Uh, there's just no time. It's, it's, you're trying to calculate from a position of, or compute that idea from a, from a position of, in which it doesn't exist. And so, you know, in heaven, circumstances and, and events and, and uh, situations may jump back and forth. And that's exactly what the book of Revelation does. You'll see it do that as we go through here. When John saw the door already open, he was permitted to see into a dimension okay, that is constantly present. It's present all the time and which governs the affairs of the earth. And that's the biblical position from beginning to end from Genesis to Revelation and especially in Genesis and Revelation. So another question arises, uh, at least it did in my mind. Did the apostle John see himself in heaven. Others have asked themselves that same question. Did John see himself in heaven? Well, I thought good, long, and hard about that. You know, I don't see how you could see himself if he's there. I mean, he's looking out his own eyeballs. So how's he going to see himself? It's, it's, it's almost like I, I'm willing to say it's just a, a question that's it's a moot question. You know, why would you even ask such a question? Well, of course John didn't see himself because he's there looking out his own eyeballs and he can't see himself. Now, that may not make much sense to you, but it certainly does to me. I think it's safe to assume that John will be raptured more than safe to assume that. And we could say, well, just because there's no mention of him seeing himself doesn't mean he wasn't there. Okay, uh, I'm going to suggest the reason why there's no mention of him seeing himself there, just as it, it just might be because the vision itself places him there. Okay, so we know we've gone through the seven letters, and we know from the seven letters in the beginning of chapter four that there is a further confirmation of a rapture that occurs before the day of the Lord, before on the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, John said, and nowhere in Scripture, and I, I think I pointed this out, I can't remember if I did or not, nowhere in Scripture is Sunday referred to as the Lord's day. It's, it's kind of a man-made term. It's the, the Lord's Day or the Day of the Lord is used in over 90 Old Testament references that refer to a very specific time 
the beginning with the tribulation period, which extends all the way through the millennium, if not beyond. But we are not in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord hasn't begun yet. And John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So he's, I believe, he's in a vision of what will occur after the rapture. And so therefore, he's, he's in the Lord's day. In the Spirit. In the Spirit, mind you. Okay? Which is what the text says. Uh, so it's uh, to me that's fur a further confirmation of a pre-trib rapture. Now I don't know how many of you believe in, you know, or, or pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, partial trib, you know, three-quarters trib or whatever. But uh, I've done enough videos on that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend much time uh, covering that. This ministry is pre-trib. It occurs before the tribulation period. It's not based on merit. And we're about to see the idea of a gap between the rapture and the opening of the first seal judgment. I don't see how you could not see a gap because just the fact that there are crowns on the 24 elders' head, which are Stephanos, not their victor's crowns, okay? It's not diadem. It's not the royalty, crown of royalty. The judgment of the believer, the Bema, is already taking place. Okay? Now, if you wanted to be honest or fair with the text, you would have to say that, that when John is taken into, through that door, into heaven, to, you know, come up here, What he sees is, well, I, you could say, I don't know, to be if you wanted to be a smart aleck, you could say, well, you know, he missed Bama. You know, because Bama's obviously already occurred. The, the vision, God, I don't see that G, in the text, I, I, I'm not seeing where Jesus included Bama in John's vision. But he begins it after that, obviously, because they have crowns on their head, which they will cast at Christ's feet. Cast before the throne. So I wanted to point that out. So I'm, I'm of the mind that when the rapture takes place, what will occur is just what John saw. And, and I'll even go as far as to say that John may very well experience in the real sense the same exact experience that, he, that occurred in his vision. All right, because if he didn't, well, then look at what we wind up with. We wind up with two entirely different scenes. I, I don't see how John's true experience after the rapture would be different from his vision. So what John saw should be precisely what we, you and I, also see, except through our own perspective, through our own eyes. But the events will be the same. We are very, folks, at this point, we are very much concerned about our, our brethren, tribulation saints, that have yet to be redeemed, delivered. It's not time to go golfing or fishing or horseback riding. Verse 2, and immediately I was in the Spirit. Well, underline the word immediately. We know the harpazo is, occurs in the twinkling of an eye. I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and I think we can agree on who was sitting on the throne. Twenty-four elders. Well, who are they? Who are the elders? That's the question. And why are they called elders? And why are there twenty-four? Well, I'm going to give you my suggestions on this. First, I think it's important to to kind of lay aside the idea that these are angelic cre creatures. They just don't fit the context, folks. Not by, not by their nature, their function, their characteristics, or their evidence through angels, angelic beings, 
in any way, shape, form, or fashion fit the description of the 24 elders. The question is, is, are they, is it half the church, half Israel? You know, or is it all Israel? Okay, this is the day of the Lord. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what I think. Uh, if you go over to chapter 5, and I know this is jumping ahead, I ain't doing that. Look at, at beginning at verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, okay, and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. Now, in the Greek, you have masculine, feminine, and neuter associated with nouns. All right? Okay? You Greek students know this. Uh, when he had taken the book, the four beasts, neuter, and four and twenty elders, masculine, okay, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they, again, masculine, sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the, the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us, us, okay? And I looked in other, I find no text, folks, that says men, all right? Redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Well, it's interesting. The text clearly says that they're coming back when they say we shall reign on the earth. They're coming back. That's exactly what we do at the second coming of Christ. We return with Christ. But what I wanted you to see was that they cannot be angelic creatures. The four beasts are neuter, the 24 elders are masculine, and the uh, the ones singing are masculine, okay? So there's no way from the text can you say that the four beasts sing. That's that was the point I want to make. I don't think I don't I don't know if angels sing or not, folks. I I, I don't. I I, th I know it's common. There's so many misconceptions about angels today. It's unreal. Uh, you got you got you got both sexes. I, I don't. I, that's not biblically correct. Uh, I, I I'm not even sure they all have wings. And I'm not sure they all sing, but it's but you will be. You will be singing a new song. And uh, so made has made us unto our God kings and priests. That's exactly what we are. Now I want to talk about. Uh, the definition of elder. The best definition of elder that I can come up with. In the New Testament, the basic concept of an elder is a representative of the people, one who rules or judges on behalf of God's, of, of God's people. Of, they rule over, over the people on behalf of God. That's the basic concept of elder. Uh, you can read about that in uh, Acts chapter 15 and 20. So that fits the context. Okay? We will reign, rule and reign with Christ, not just for a thousand years, but for eternity. All right? And many Christians have the idea that that only is that's limited to the thousand year reign of Christ. It's, it's, it's not. We will rule and reign with Christ forever. So, 
these elders, that's basically the best description that we can, that I can find, I believe, that perfectly aligns with the context, with the text. So the next question would be, why are there 24? And Steve, the numbers guy here, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll admit to you, I'm, I'm torn back and forth. I'm kind of, you know, uh, one minute, you know, I, I don't care. And, and then the next minute I'm looking for some meaning behind 24. I do not believe that God gives us, says anything that he doesn't, that there's not some meaning behind. I mean, there's a reason why he, he could have said what, 10 elders, he could have said 100 elders, he could have said 75, but he said 24. So we're going to look at 24. I think it begins, it would, the best place to begin would be to, for you to take a note, jot a note down of Chronicles 24. That's easy to remember because it's chapter 24. Uh, even, even 25, 24 and 25, what we find out there is David divided the priesthood into, guess what, 24. And they represented the whole Levitical priesthood. So there would be 24 and one high priest. Okay? Think shadows and patterns here. You know, the structure of the temple, the earthly, I'm talking about the earthly temple with its, with its vessels, its, its services, its rituals, all of that was patterned according to, th to the things in heaven. Okay? The identity of the 24, who they are, well, is, is fairly clear from the text, folks. Their position, uh, white raiment. If, if you want to go over to Isaiah 61, you see white raiment in, it referred to in relationship to imputed righteousness promised uh, to all of us in Christ, if you, if you remember, it was promised to those in Sardis, the church at Sardis. So they can't be angels. That also proves them to be the church, uh, as do their crowns. So their judgment had to have already taken place. And their worship, when you look at their worship, praising God for the for the judgment that he exercises during the tribulation period, as well as God's redeeming those that are his during that period, the, the redemption that he accomplishes uh, during that period, all confirm these to, be, to represent the church. Not 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles, you know, or all Israel, or, uh, you know, those views, folks, are in conflict with God's order his program of resurrection, there's an order to it. There's where I was able to resolve the issue. It was looking at God's order or timing of resurrections for His people. What, what scholars would ref, often refer to as the resurrection program. The order being first Christ, then the church, then tribulation saints and Old Testament saints at the second coming, all right, so they can't be Israel. They can't be Old Testament saints. And then, of course, uh, at the end of the millennium, you've got included in God's resurrection program, you've got the unsaved who are resurrected at the end of the millennium. So the very moment you die, the very next experience that you have is the great white throne judgment, just as... If the Christian dies, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And you know that I believe that our death is the rapture. So whether we're alive or dead, we'll soon be with the Lord. I love you all with every thing in me. I love the Lord, folks. I love His Word and I love His people. And I ask for your continued prayers for my healing. I, I want to thank you for all of your wonderful comments that you leave. 
Follow us on Parlor. We're leaving Facebook. Uh, had enough of Mark Zuckerberg. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.